Welcome everyone to this edition of the Verifiability Talk. It's my honor to introduce our speaker, Nicola Paoletti. Nicola is our colleague here at King's College London, he, where he's a senior lecturer. Uh, his areas of interest are in uh, safety and security certification of cyber physical systems. And he's interested in um, designing systems, cyber physical systems that are provably correct uh, with an emphasis on biomedical applications. Um, he has also worked on data driven verification of CPSs, whereby formal analysis and uh, principal learning methods come together to provide correctness guarantees. He got his PhD from University of Camerino in Italy. Uh, then he moved on to work at Microsoft Cambridge, Microsoft Research Cambridge. He was at uh, Stony Brook University um, and then at Royal Holloway. And finally, uh, he moved uh, at Kings, where we are very glad to have him here. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola, for having accepted our invitation. Um, this meeting is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube. So if you don't want to appear uh, in the YouTube recording, um, in the YouTube posting, please join us as a guest and turn off your camera and that should be fine. Um, and without further ado, I give the floor to Nicola. Nicola, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mama, for the for the introduction. So the topic I'm going to discuss today is predictive monitoring of hybrid systems, and this is joint work uh, with some collaborators, including Luca Francesca from Trieste and, and uh, Scott Smoke and Scott Stoller from from Stone Group. And so the structure of the talk, uh, um, the, the plan for today is the following: we, we're going to cover some preliminaries, uh, which will include uh, what is an average system uh, in the first place and what we mean by uh, verifying every systems and the diff and some motivation for predictive monitoring and how uh, this differs from uh, more you know traditional reachability checking and then <clears throat> we move to discuss uh, this predictive monitoring method that we developed which is called neural predictive monitoring in that uh, it uses machine learning techniques and, and neural networks and uh, it uses also techniques to uh, um, provide some kind of probabilistic guarantees to these predictions and we show how to also derive some uh, error detection uh, techniques uh, that, that rely on measures of predictive uncertainty and um, also uh, how to improve the, the same models using uh, active learning. We will go through a few experimental results and discuss uh, recent work where we extended the, the, the uh, uh, you know, base uh, base framework that, that I'm going to uh, discuss today. Okay, so what is an average system? An average system is a system that is characterized by some combination of continuous physical uh, analog uh, components, like we can see here on the left and discrete or digital components from from a model viewpoint we we, we can see a, a models that combine yeah uh, continuous modeling modeling that like um, uh, uh, differential equations for instance and on the discrete side uh, we, we can have some kind of you know state machine and <clears throat> as a matter of fact hybrid systems are a model of cyber physical systems and, and these systems are systems that are composed by some sort of controller, the cyber part and, and, and some plant, the, the physical part that's being uh, controlled. And, and, and these kind of systems um, are found in many uh, real world applications where safety is a top priority, okay? We have, for instance, medical devices, avionics and chemical plants or you know, uh, autonomous or semi-autonomous features of cars. All of these are uh, safety critical applications. And so, but for these implications, uh, we want the systems, the, these are systems to, to behave as, <clears throat> as intended, okay? So for instance, uh, we want that a pacemaker always keeps the heart rate within some, some healthy bounds. And we want that, uh, you know, a cruise control for a car always keeps, you know, some, some safety distance or, you know, more autonomous cars, we, we, we want them uh, that uh, they don't collide. Um, but how to do this, uh, you know, uh, this analysis in, a, in a, a precise and exhaustive manner, then, yeah, formal verification uh, comes to play. So this is the technique that we use uh, to automatically uh, uh, analyze the correctness of system in, in an exhaustive way. 
and ensure the way it works, verification people must be very, uh, you know, familiar with this diagram. Uh, the, the, the procedure takes an input, some model of the system, M, some form of the system, some specification, Phi, and then the, the, the system verifies whether or not the, 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 the specification, which is typically some kind of temporal specification, is satisfied by the model. If so, it optionally, uh, it, it tells you yes, and optionally returns some proof. And if not, it typically returns a temporal exam. Okay. And the, the, the thing to stress is that, you know, results verification are, are, are proved in a you know, mathematically uh, rigorous uh, way, a priori correct. Okay. And <clears throat> the verification priori system is usually formulated as uh, reachability, uh, as reachability check, as you can see also in this diagram. Essentially, you have some initial regional states or states of the average systems, okay, and uh, 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 regional states that, 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 that uh, of the state space that you're interested in, and you want to uh, check whether well, starting from this region I, you can reach a state in this red region U. Optionally, you know, you have both time bounded and unbounded versions of, of, of reachability. And so, as I said before, uh, we use for verification formal mathematical models of the systems, and there are plenty of those. Uh, these include hybrid automata, timed automata, hybrid dynamic systems, switch systems, and so on and so forth. And here, let me, let me show you, you know, for those of you that uh, don't know this stuff, uh, an example of a hybrid automaton. And this is a, a textbook example uh, representing a thermostat. Okay, here we see that we have two, the, the discrete part that is represented by, by the, 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 of this kind of state machine that transitions between these two discrete locations. And this location represents the, the, um, the state, the situation when the heating is off, and this represents the state where the heating is on. And so when the heating is off, X, which is the temperature, drops at a rate of, of, of 0.1. And when it's on, it still drops at a rate, but it increases at a constant rate of phi. Okay. And essentially, we transition from this state into this other. Uh, when the temperature uh, uh, you know, uh, drops 19. And on the other uh, way around, we transition from on to off when uh, it, it goes above uh, 21. And so even this simple for example, uh, you know, shows so some uh, uh, non-trivial sophistication because, as I said, we have a combination of discrete states, these locations here, and, and continuous dynamics. And not in these examples, uh, in this example, but in general, these dynamics can be uh, non-linear, okay, which can make the analysis much more difficult. And, and moreover, even this is, in this simple example, we have uh, non-determinism uh, in uh, in the intersection of uh, invariant and jump uh, conditions. Essentially, this tells you that you <clears throat> can't stay in this location, uh, you, sorry, that you can remain in this location only as long as the temperature is above uh, 18, okay? But this means that you can transition from here to here uh, at any temperature value between 18 and 19. So there is non-determinism here, okay? But now let, let me show you, you know, uh, a quick and incomplete survey of uh, interesting examples of uh, every system just to, to convince you that uh, the, the, the stuff is uh, relevant. This is an example of a timed automata, timed automata network for a, a model of dual chamber pacemaker. And as, met, uh, as a matter of fact, yeah, timed automata are subclass of hybrid automata and um, they can be composed, you know, simple automata uh, can be composed in networks to, to, to create a more complex automata. This is an example of a uh, hybrid automata model of uh, the action potential inside a cardiac cell. And you see a combination of uh, you know, uh, differential equations describing the evolution of the voltage and uh, corresponds at these spaces here, approximately. Uh, an example of a hybrid automata model for uh, prostate cancer treatment. And you know, these, these are biomedical examples that are uh, very dear to me. Uh, but we have also you know, more um, kind of a real life example. This is an example of a powertrain uh, system uh, model developed by uh, Toyota researchers that represents um, a fuel uh, control systems that, that, that wants to track some optimal air fuel uh, ratio. 
This is a hybrid automata model of uh, cruise control and models for uh, this is for the uh, operational uh, flight program found in uh, Boeing um, military fighters. And so the, the, this kind of system is responsible to support uh, avionics and cockpit functions for the pilot. So if you're familiar with MATLAB stateful models, which is a, a very well, you know, um, very popular uh, model-based uh, uh, model uh, software, uh, model-based design software, and state flow models are um, nothing but a particular kind of uh, hybrid system as well. And yes, and there are you know plenty of other uh, benchmarks uh, that, that that are uh, that have been uh, developed, including you know, quad rotors, wind turbine, and and, and, and many more. And so we mentioned reachability checking for every system. So it turns out it, it is well known that. Uh, reachability is undecided for even very simple class of every systems. And so that, that that's the end of my talk. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but in practice, people, you know, analyze these systems anyway. And what, what do they do to, to, to circumvent undecidability? Uh, we over approximate the set of states that, that are reachable from, from the region. Okay, and reachability checking tools for hybrid systems are <clears throat> typically based on a set based reachability. They compute this kind of rich tubes that, that we see here, or maybe you know the states are represented with, with some sort of tractable form of constraints and, and they apply constraint solving. But the, the, the principles, the principle is similar. But the, the main idea is again that we over approximate the set of reachable states using some tractable uh, representation. Okay, so it works as follows. You get this initial region of the um, of your average system and some type bound. You compute this kind of rich tube. And then you check if the rich tube intersects some uh, unsafe region. Okay, if it doesn't intersect, then you're sure that, that your system is safe. Okay, but if it does intersect the unsafe region, then you, you can't be 100% sure that it's unsafe because this could be due to the over approximation of the uh, of the reachable set. So there could be, you know, false positive, false alarms. But false alarms are those kind of, you know, errors that the verification uh, people are are willing to accept. Okay, <clears throat> of course, because it's better, you know, better to be safe than sorry. And, but let me, you know, let me also uh, stress that uh, reachability of various systems uh, is computationally very expensive because the, the, this kind of algorithms don't, do not just require to do differential equation solving okay but they, they need to do differential equation solving from sets of states so they need to propagate a set with respect to the uh, all the uh, dynamics and, and you have also non-determinism uh, uh, at play and, and given that you have this over this kind of uh, canonical representation for the sets uh, another, um, another problem is that uh, the, the, the over approximation due to the set representation or constraint representation blows up uh, with time. Okay. And so let me introduce the uh, main motivation behind this work that is uh, predictive monitoring. <clears throat> so, predictive monitoring is the problem of predicting at runtime uh, future violations of the system from the current state. Okay, so we want to predict essentially violations before they happen. And you, you can see that as a, as a sort of uh, model checking performed at, at runtime. And predictive monitoring is very important for runtime safety assurance of every systems and uh, cyber physical systems. So for instance, you can use predict, you could use predictive monitoring uh, to figure out is, if a failure is imminent and, and maybe uh, switch to some uh, fail safe uh, mode of, of the system. And, and this is the uh, principle uh, behind uh, the uh, so called simplex architecture for uh, online safe control, where you switch between a complex uh, but not necessarily safe controller and, and a safe uh, controller. Or, or similarly, one could think of using this kind of uh, pretty monitors in uh, online uh, control and, and, and essentially check that the optimal control action uh, found by, by, by the controller uh, um, is not predicted to, to, to lead to a violation. So I, I'd like to draw a few differences now between 
pretty monitoring and, and reachability check. Okay. In, in pretty monitoring, uh, we are typically interested in, in reachability from a single state, the, the current state of the system, as opposed to a region of states uh, as we do reachability uh, checking. And moreover, since we, we we uh, typically, you know, we would deploy the, this kind of uh, monitoring, pretty monitoring uh, at, at runtime and, and execute it, you know, uh, periodically and frequently. We are uh, more interested in in checking short time horizons, even though this is not necessarily a, a rule. Um, and so this is periodic and this re uh, analysis that is uh, repeated uh, frequently. Okay, uh, ideally, uh, whenever you have a state update. On the other end, reachability checking is more of a one-off analysis, okay? Uh, and and you can include potentially long uh, time horizons. And, and for the reason said above, uh, pretty monitoring has strict time constraints. So the analysis must be carried carried out quickly, okay? We, we need to have enough time uh, to, 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 to act, to intervene if a failure is predicted. Instead, reachability checking is an offline uh, technique, a design time technique, so you, you don't necessarily have uh, a hard, uh, you know, time constraints there for, for the for the analysis. And so, in summary, um, we can say that fully fledged uh, reachability checking is is unsuitable for line analysis for for the complications that that I said before. It is simply too uh, too expensive. And after all, at runtime is not. Um, uh, it's not unusual that uh, the system, the real system, deviates from the you know, offline design time model. And so one might argue that you know, the strong guarantees that you have with reachability check might, might be no longer valid. So in our words, in some cases, it might, might be you know, an overkill anyway. And <clears throat> but in short, for PT monitoring, what, what we look for is for accurate and fast methods, okay, and, and, and computationally efficient uh, methods. And so we might admit some errors as long as these errors can be somehow quantified and, and guaranteed. So this is a possible formulation of the uh, priority monitoring problem. Okay, we're giving an input some every system M, uh, so a reachability specification essentially, a read system with some state space and actually a distribution of state uh, a script X. Uh, we have a time bound T and a set of unsafe state uh, okay, here I changed the notation into D, sorry for that, it used to be U. And, and so the objective here would be to find some function F star, some predictor or uh, uh, also called the state classifier that maps states of the average systems into you know, reachability values, so uh, true or false. And F star is, such, is, is uh, found in such a way to minimize this expression here that is nothing but the probability of error of the uh, of, of, of this function, okay? And <clears throat> we call a, a particular state of the system positive if it is you know predicted by this function to to, to be you know equal to one, meaning that to to reach uh, to reach the um, um, region of interest and negative otherwise. And we can note that uh, in you know in, in machine learning lingo, finding this such a function is called you know solving a binary classification problem. Okay, and so <clears throat> to find such a function, one can can just look for for any function. You need to restrict the search space to specific classes of functions, and what we do here is to consider the class of functions given us by neural nets. And so the question that we asked ourselves was, can we use neural nets to uh, represent the, the reachability function? In principle, yes. You know, there are theoretical uh, results that tells us that uh, neural networks are universal approximators, meaning that they can approximate arbitrarily well any uh, borrowed measurable function. And under all mild assumptions, uh, um, every system reachability is borrowed measurable. But yeah, that, that's not the main point. But the, the, the crucial point is that a trained neural network can run in linear time with respect only to the, the, the size of the input and the number of neurons, okay, meaning that the, the execution time of a neural network wouldn't depend anymore on the com actual complexity of the average systems or in the time bound, okay? And so 
if one chooses a reasonable uh, an architecture reasonable size this you know the, 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 this, this would make you know neural networks suitable for being executed in, in an online fashion so suitably suitable for uh, predictive monitoring uh, and so in, in practice even though you know this universal property can, can, can be uh, achieved uh, in, in practice we all we, we tend to have very good accuracy with neural networks but oops this is the automated lights in, in the office <laughs> okay well, you still can see me right yes, yes uh, but prediction errors uh, can't be uh, entirely uh, avoided and so we have two kinds of prediction errors. We have uh, false positives, that is uh, when a negative state is predicted to be both positive, so meaning a state that doesn't lead to a violation, to, to, to reaching an unsafe state instead is predicted to do so. And this is a false alarm. In, in our words, uh, the, 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 the same kind of errors uh, that, that reachability checking due to uh, over approximation. But uh, more worryingly, that they can also produce false negative errors. So uh, a state that is positive, that is going to lead to violation, is predicted to be uh, you know, all, all good, all safe. And, and this clearly, uh, this is more worryingly because can compromise system uh, safety. And so, yes, here I included this, uh, uh, this chemistry from uh, uh, XKCD, uh, which I, I found uh, uh, fun name <laughs> and you know this is uh, uh, how some people see uh, uh, you know uh, deep learning and, and maybe you know not too far from reality but anyway and so the starting point of our work was uh, a method called uh, neural state classification published in 2018 and um, here we solved the, the, this pretty monitoring problem with this kind of approach essentially mm, <clears throat> we use we use Mm, uh, assume some distributional states. We have a reachability oracle, so uh, a reachability checker, essentially, that we use to label the straight with the uh, ground truth. In this way, we construct a training set. We use this training set to uh, learn uh, a, a state uh, classifier. And then, you know, we also use some sort of adversarial sampling to, 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 to sample uh, false negative states. And, and uh, with active learning, we, we, we augment the training data with, with false negative example with, with the idea of, of reducing those. OK, so this was all in all a good start. OK, but there are, uh, you know, uh, two, uh, I mean, there is a big limitation, essentially. How can we trust the predictions of a neural net in, 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 in this kind of, you know, safety critical applications? Or, you know, as uh, Reverend Lovestroy's wife would put it, you know, uh, well, won't somebody please think of the guarantees? This is, you know, this is uh, the, the classical complaint, you know, of a formal verification person. Uh, but yes, so the, this this approach per se that doesn't have any correctness guarantees. Okay, very good accuracy, but no correctness guarantees. And even with some kind of guarantees in place, what would be good would be to, to have some sort of mechanism to prevent prediction errors at runtime meaning that I want to flag uh, states uh, that uh, I think my model can uh, uh, can commit prediction mistakes, okay? Where I think my model can commit prediction mistakes. And so once uh, once I, you know, uh, I, I detect a state where my model can be potentially erroneous, then I can decide, for instance, to take some, uh, you know, uh, safe conservative uh, action in, in that case, okay? And so, yes, this essentially these two limitations are, are some, somewhat addressed in, in, the, uh, in the series of work on, on neural operative monitoring. And so I think we now can now revisit the operative monitoring problem in, in order to account for uh, probabilistic correctness guarantees. So the setting is, you know, uh, reachability. Uh, our system is as, as it was before, but we given an input to also some probability level, some significance level epsilon. Okay, and the problem now becomes that of finding some function i that maps uh, a state into a prediction region. Okay, so not, not just a single prediction, but a prediction region that for which this is satisfied, meaning in short, for which the true unknown reachability value related to you know an input, uh, a test input x star. Uh, uh, is included in the region with probability 
uh, at least one minus epsilon. Okay, and, and this is a much stronger statement compared to uh, to the previous one that, that that I made. And uh, we also note that the, the, this kind of guarantees are, are very similar to the guarantees that you have with statistical uh, model checking, which is a, a you know a very popular uh, a sampling based technique for the verification of probabilistic systems. Okay, and this is essentially how we extended the, uh, you know, the, the the previous approach in order to account for for these things. Uh, I know this a lot, it's a lot to to <laughs> to go through, but I try to uh, uh, to make myself, uh, uh, you know, uh, understandable. And so the, the main novelty and the, the the new components are highlighted in in blue. But the main novelty here is essentially to to, to extend the simple, you know, state classification approach. We conform a prediction, which is a uh, a technique that is gaining uh, more and more traction recently in, in reliable and safe machine learning, and with, uh, we will explain soon. And the idea, uh, I mean, what gives us conform a prediction on, you know, uh, on, uh, on its own is a uh, is a prediction region that has the guarantees uh, that are, that are, that I just explained. So that is guaranteed to include the true unknown prediction with arbitrary probability. Okay, and, and this would be enough uh, already, but we also use uh, conform a prediction to derive measures of predictive uncertainty for the predictions. Okay, and the, the key idea here is that uncertain predictions are those that are most likely to produce uh, classification errors. And so uh, we use these measures of uncertainty to derive some optimal uh, error uh, detection criterion and that that we use to decide whether or not to accept or reject a particular uh, prediction, even before you know, even before seeing it actually, uh, even before seeing the 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 the, the, the truth of what I mean. And uh, another point is that <clears throat> the uncertain the uncertain predictions uh, identified through uh, these methods, okay, can be used for uh, active learning, meaning for retraining the, the the classifier, for retraining the monitor with those uncertain inputs. In, in, in this way, we improve the, the, the classification on, on those very inputs that, that are found uh, unreliable. And this is the, yeah, the summary of the approach. Okay. And so, okay, this is just a summary of, of what I just said. Okay, let, let me uh, introduce uh, quickly uh, conforma prediction. So conforma prediction is a technique that works on top of any supervised learning model. And it is that it complements single pot predictions with a prediction region that has the guarantees that I, uh, you know, uh, mentioned uh, before for a given significance level, uh, epsilon, and and some test points. The prediction region uh, denoted uh, in this way is guaranteed to uh, contain the true unknown class of X star uh, with probability one minus epsilon. And one of important on the, you know, the 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 the, the, the Key properties of conformal operation is that it's distribution free, meaning that they, they don't, it doesn't make any parametric assumption. And the only assumption is exchangeability, that is a weaker version of uh, you know, uh, data being um, uh, independently and identically uh, distributed. Um, and, and what else? And, and these kind of guarantees are, uh, uh, I didn't put it in the slide, but uh, I would like to say these kind of guarantees are finite sample, meaning uh, non asymptotic. Okay, and, and this is also uh, important. <clears throat> um, and yeah, this is this is showed essentially uh, uh, in, in this cartoon. More, more intuitively, we can think of a prediction region as a as a confidence interval. But a confidence interval, you, you build it you build it from observations. Okay, a prediction region you don't build it from observations because you don't you, you don't have you want to predict you don't have the observations. But uh, um, you, you build it from from the model, okay? That that's the uh, is a confidence interval for, for for a prediction essentially. And so the main idea behind this technique uh, is that uh, the prediction includes a prediction region that is that that contains the classes that are likely to be true, okay? And more technically. This region is constructed via inversion of a suitable hypothesis test. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure now. Uh, I'm gonna. Uh, uh, I will have included the, the enough, you know, uh, background material for everyone to follow, but but I hope so. 
Um, and so the idea is follow you have uh, uh, the test statistic is uh, uh, a so called non conformity uh, non conformity function non conformity measure h which is a a, a notion of generalized uh, residuals if you like uh, the uh, this function h it takes an input an input uh, it takes an input an input point and, and a candidate uh, label y and it measures the distance between this candidate label y and the prediction on x Okay, and so the idea is that we want to uh, we want somehow to, to to get access to the distribution of the of these generalized the residuals of of, of the uh, these nonconformity scores. Okay, given the true the true uh, classes, the true reachability predictions. Okay, and, and to approximate this distribution, we use a set of calibration points. Okay, and then the idea is that at any tentative label, here we have only two rich or not rich, but in, in this, this extends, of course, to, to multiple classes. A tentative label is excluded from the prediction region if it seems unlikely that the corresponding residual, the corresponding uh, uh, non conformity score, is distributed according to this distribution. And that that's essentially uh, you know test test inversion where uh, in, in the statistical hypothesis testing the same way you construct a confidence interval uh, by test inversion using the, the corresponding yeah, hypothesis test and so we can see you know the, this kind of hypothesis test as a proxy for testing you know uh, you know whether or not uh, why uh, why is a, is a, the true label for um, for a given point x. I have a little example here that hopefully will uh, clarify things. And so <clears throat> this histogram here represents uh, the distribution of, uh, of true scores. In general, this, uh, this scores represents distance between a label and a prediction. And so they, they, they are positive, but there are some variants of conformal prediction where this is not the case, but in, in this case, this, this is the case. And what we do? We have our, our input points and we have a set of candidate labels, in our case only two, zero or one, and we compute, so we compute the distance of uh, the prediction, uh, our prediction on X and, and one of the two labels, and suppose that we find a particularly high distance, okay, uh, between, between these two that corresponds at this point here uh, in, in the histogram. Then we have that uh, you know uh, the probability, okay, of observing according to the distribution of the true or scores of observing a, a score equal or higher than 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 this one is very small. is smaller than our our epsilon. And so this is to say that it is unlikely. It seems unlikely that uh, uh, the the y uh, is is the true uh, label uh, for uh, x star okay and we don't include it in the in, in the prediction region instead if we get say um a score that that appears here this the, the probability of observing a score that is equal or bigger than that uh, is very high and so uh, we don't have uh, you know uh, reasons to, re to, to to reject this prediction and we include it in the, in, the, in the prediction region okay I think I've got approximately 10 to 15 minutes left. One, okay. Yeah, that's fine, yes. Okay. And so again, let me remind you that uh, such constructed uh, prediction regions uh, are guaranteed to include a true and known class with probability at least one mass of silence. Okay, but now we can have, in binary classification, we can have three situations, okay? We can have that the prediction region includes only one uh, value, Okay, and, and 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 by definition, uh, it, 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 this is the true the true value with probability one minus epsilon. Or, or we can have these two uh, a bit of you know weird cases. Uh, one that the prediction region includes both values. Okay, and so this is an example say, of, of an uncertain uh, prediction, which can happen, for instance, when the input is close to the uh, decision boundary, or we even have the, the weirder case where the prediction region is empty. Okay, and this is an example of an kind of an implausible uh, input, for instance, an out of distribution uh, input. Uh, it can happen something like that. Uh, 
but yes, I think that uh, we can all agree that we can uh, uh, deem the prediction reliable when the corresponding prediction region is a singleton. Okay, when either we don't have uncertainty or, or we have some information at least. Okay, and so let me put on a line, you know, how these prediction regions arise from the p values. So, sorry, I forgot to mention that these probabilities values here highlighted in 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 uh, in red here and, and, and in blue here are called p-values, okay? And this is a, a, a small p-value, smaller than epsilon. That's why it's rejecting. This is a large p-value, larger than epsilon. <clears throat> and so this is p of y, the p-value of the predicted class, and this is p of y bar, the, the, the p-value of the non-predicted class, which if, if the uh, distance function is well-defined, is going to be, of course, smaller than this one. And so we see below here the significance level and we notice that we have a singleton region so something that that we consider reliable only if uh, the uh, sorry the significance level falls between the p value of the predicted class and the p value of the predicted class okay so this is really the range of p values that gives us you know a nice and, and crisp prediction uh, prediction region Okay, and so if the gap between these two p values is large, this means that we have a more and more reliable prediction. In other words, uh, the reliability of the prediction depends less and less on the choice of the significance level. And so this made us think, sorry, this made us think, is it possible to have some rejection criterion that is independent of, of the particular sorry, confidence or uh, significance level. And so the idea here is that, uh, uh, it, so the, the, the uncertain predictions are, are those that uh, are non singleton. And so those where we have a low value of P of Y, the P value of the predicted class, and high value of P of bar I or low value of one minus P of uh, Y I bar, uh, sorry, P of Y bar. Okay, and so these two for us represent our, uh, I should say certainty measures because when they are low, it means that the, uh, the prediction is, uh, is uncertain. And so essentially what, uh, what we do here is to, um, you know, construct a, a um, essentially use this to determine when, whether or not to, to, to reject some, pre some prediction. <clears throat> and besides being a principal criterion, this is very efficient to compute because uh, it requires just to compute two p-values, which you need, you need to do anyway to compute the, the, the prediction region. So it comes essentially uh, for free. And, and let me stress again, this is independent of the choice of the uh, significance of the significance level. But how can we define these error uh, uh, detection criteria? So in other words, how can we establish thresholds for these two values that tell us, okay, above this threshold, we, we keep it, or below this threshold, we, we reject it. And, and the idea is that to formulate a second learning problem, an auxiliary <laughs> learning problem, where we learn uh, thresholds that optimally separate correct and wrong uh, predictions. In very short, we do this by, by training a, a support a, a vector classifiers where, where the inputs are the uncertainty measures and, and the prediction is whether or not uh, a point with those uncertainty measure led to a correct prediction, okay? And so the, the result essentially is a hyperplane that often separates the, the, the set of uncertain, the space of uncertainty measures uh, um, depending or not uh, uh, depending on whether or not they lead to a, a wrong prediction. And that's essentially how we, we learn these uh, optimal rejection uh, thresholds. And, and of course, we can also specialize this if we wanted to focus, for instance, on, on false negative uh, errors only. Finally, the last piece of the puzzle has, uh, is this idea of active learning. So in principle, we have this, this criterion for rejecting predictions, and we, we, uh, we, we could stop here in principle, but if we wanted to do better, we can improve our model on those predictions that were uh, uh, evaluated as uncertain as are reliable by uh, our technique. And so 
the idea is that we focus the retraining only was on those points where, where the model is, is, uh, is found uh, unreliable. The algorithm is very simple. Uh, we, we, we draw a few, uh, uh, you know, some, some random input points, and we keep only those that are evaluated as uncertainty, as uncertain, sorry, by uh, our method. And this is important because, uh, you know, a labeling or uh, with the true reachability value takes time because it, it, it requires invoking the reachability oracle, so the reachability checker. And so, you know, we, we focus the, the, the retraining only uh, where it matters. And and then uh, yes, we, uh, we 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 train a new predictor on this augmented data set, and we we train new error detection criteria on the on the augmented validation sets, and we repeat this, uh, you know, uh, as desired. So I can take questions at the end, but since we were approaching the results section, maybe uh, if there are some some existential questions. Uh, here, uh, I'm happy to, to take them. Are there any questions before we move on? I could ask a question to, but maybe you could also finish and then we can start asking questions. Okay. Okay. okay, sounds great. And so the, the results that I'm going to report are those from the, 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 the journal version of the paper, but we have you know uh, different sets of benchmarks that, that we already evaluated in each paper. We with you know comparable results, and here we consider a benchmark of six hybrid automata uh, that uh, you know um, range uh, in, in complexity. So, for instance, we have deterministic, non-deterministic systems, linear and non-linear dynamics, and so on and so forth. And the kind of performance measures that we look are uh, the prediction accuracy of, of of the neural network of the state classifier, which is of course important. How many true prediction errors our criterion is able to detect? And the overall rate of rejection, which also accounts uh, naturally the points that, that are wrongly rejected, where you know that, that the model would have would have predicted correctly, but uh, we, we we reject it nevertheless. And also the runtime uh, efficiency, because this is, uh, as I explained before, uh, very uh, important. And so this is, these are the results on those benchmarks uh, with the, the, the approach without using active learning, okay? The first thing to note, I think, is the high prediction accuracy. We have a prediction accuracy that is above, well above 99% for all uh, case studies. And this is really what we want for, uh, you know, operating monitoring for uh, safety uh, critical systems. And the other thing to note is that the detection rate in all but one case managed to uh, detect all the prediction errors apart from this one case. <clears throat> and, but the, the only, the, the downside of, of, of this analysis here, uh, of these results essentially is that we have a fairly high uh, rejection rate, uh, meaning that we tend to be a bit uh, conservative uh, around five up to, you know, up to 6% of the predictions are are rejected, which, you know, uh, some people might argue it, it, it becomes, you know, not, not, not extremely useful. But then if we do uh, active learning, what we find is that all metrics, but this little one in red, improve. Uh, we have the prediction accuracy uh, uh, goes, you know, even higher, reaching close to 100% for, for, for most cases. And the rejection rate also drops uh, significantly, meaning that, that we are more tight, more, more precise, less conservative. The only thing that is that for, for some reason that, that we haven't investigated enough, we sacrifice a little bit the, the detection rate for the errors in the, in the helicopter here uh, case study. And I guess that the reason for that is that this active learning approach adds to the training set only very, very informative uh, samples, th those for which we are uh, we are uncertain. Um, I don't report here uh, the empirical coverage of the prediction regions because, as as I mentioned before, you know we, we have these theoretical guarantees, and these these guarantees are also seen uh, empirically. Okay, and so it would be you know uh, quite of a um, uh, useless column. <laughs> um, regarding the runtime, the 
time that we take to do the reachability prediction and to decide whether or not we, we, we trust this prediction is in the order of milliseconds. Okay, so uh, from you know 1.4 to 4 uh, milliseconds. This is the the, the the system with more dimensions than, than uh, I think around 20 dimensions. Otherwise, it stay it takes like two milliseconds more. And and this is this really makes the approach suitable for for online uh, analysis, and I think that's uh, that's very important. So finally, let me wrap up with a few extensions that that we worked on uh, recently, if that if there is time. Um, yes, we do have time. So <clears throat> we mentioned that our approach builds on conformal prediction, but. Uh, um, you might be aware that uh, you know Bayesian inference is, is the uh, other, if not the, the, the you know best known uh, approach for uncertainty uh, quantification in, in in machine learning. And here I put this, this funny kind of uh, you know uh, box match against Fisher and, and bias Fisher being a representative of uh, you know uh, classical frequentist uh, statistics. Um, and so what we done in, in this approach was to compare the, the, the conformal approach with a kind of purely Bayesian approach that has the same components that, that we saw before in that diagram, but where every bit uh, uses uh, some kind of Bayesian model. So we use Bayesian neural networks for uncertainty quantification, and we replace the support vector classifier with a, a Gaussian process. Mm. Classifiers and the, the, the main takeaways are essentially that um, for starters, uh, the predictive distribution of the Bayesian neural network uh, is not well calibrated, uh, meaning that it doesn't uh, reflect the, the empirical one. And so the, the, the regions that you construct on top of the uh, uh, predictive distribution of the Bayesian neural network called credible regions have no uh, probabilistic guarantees. Okay, and this is the, the, the main uh, downside. And second, Bayesian inference of, of neural nets for large data sets become, uh, becomes uh, prohibitive. Okay, and so for, for some inference techniques, uh, variational inference is what was good uh, in all cases, but you know, some more precise Bayesian inference techniques struggled and uh, were unsuccessful actually we, we, uh, in some instances. And the world these models and, and the what kind of training uh, uh, the training pipeline is uh, it takes more to tune compared to the conformal uh, approach that, that, that works really uh, straight out of the box and at runtime is slightly uh, more uh, expensive and and finally and most importantly uh, the conformal approach outperformed uh, the, the Bayesian approach in all metrics and so these I think uh, um, is, is, is useful beyond the specific case study as a comparison between uh, the, these two main philosophies of, of uncertainty quantification. Uh, we also extended the, the approach to the challenging but realistic case when the true system is unknown. Inside a physical system, we most often have access only to partial and noisy observations of the state through some, yeah, some, some sensing function. And so uh, here we developed two approaches. One approach is end-to-end. -end. Essentially, uh, we, we uh, repeat the, the, the I mean, we have a, a same interface for the uh, for the um, similar interface of, for the state classifier. The only difference is that we learn to classify directly the raw observations instead of the states. And the step is where we first uh, um, uh, learn to predict a state estimate from the observations along with a, a, a prediction region for the estimated state. And we use the state estimation to uh, uh, perform reachability uh, prediction. And the nice thing is that these two, these two bits are trained jointly such that the, the, the state estimator so state estimator is also uh, you know, so some loss term that, that, that um, measures how, how much the estimate leads to predict nicely the, uh, uh, the, 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 the true reachability value. And this was published last year. And something that we published literally, we published, sorry, I wish I could say that, that we submitted uh, literally this week is uh, um, an extension of the approach for stochastic dynamics uh, and, and temporal logic. Essentially, we go beyond reachability by considering a uh, specification given uh, uh, as temporal logic. This is called, in particular, signal temporal logic, a kind of 
linear uh, temporal logic. And we go also beyond Boolean predictions, because we, beyond yes or no Boolean prediction by predicting what is called the, the robust signal temporal logic semantics that gives you a quantitative notion uh, of, of satisfaction. And the other, you know, I think nice extension is that we we can work with, uh, you know, a general class of uh, stochastic processes uh, and, and not, not just, uh, you know, uh, hybrid dynamics, but also, you know, uh, stochastic dynamics. And uh, in, in very, in very short, uh, uh, what we do is that we, we apply some uh, uh, recent techniques on, in, on uh, for conformal inference for quantile regression. So now the problem becomes one of regression. and. Uh, you know, uh, predicting uh, predicting quantiles of the distribution of this um, of, of this robustness uh, values for future trajectories of the system. Um, and so, to sum up, what we presented was a method to derive pretty monitors for IV systems. This is a machine learning uh, method that uses neural networks, uh, which uh, provide us with high prediction accuracy, uh, but we know we, we can't trust them 100%. And so we use uh, techniques, uh, in particular, conformal prediction to derive uh, probabilistic guarantees and as a byproduct, uncertainty measures, uncertainty measures that we use to uh, <clears throat> derive optimal error uh, detection criteria. Uh, our results uh, found that uh, these techniques are computationally very efficient and so suitable for runtime online analysis and active learning. We found that it is uh, very effective in improving accuracy and uh, making the uh, error detection criterion uh, less conservative. Uh, we showed a few extensions and there are uh, more to come. For instance, we're thinking of applying this to compute joint prediction regions, so multi-dimensional prediction regions and applying it to, to, to uh, multi-agent uh, systems, among others. OK, uh, and that is it. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very exciting. Several results. Actually, you answered some of my questions uh, oh. during the last part when you ex mentioned the extensions. Uh, particularly, I found that uh, quantitative extension with uh, robust semantics very, very exciting. It's very interesting. Good. We have time for a few questions. Um, anyone wants to ask the first question? Mohammed, I, I might ask a question, please. It's sure, uh, please. if Nicola, thank you very much for a very nice presentation. Uh, uh, very helpful to the group as well. I wanted to ask a question, which is a, a, a bit by the by in terms of what you presented, but this is still very important for the community. You mentioned several model checkers when you were talking about reachability versus uh, predictability there. Um, the experience we've had in the node is that when you when you try to use those model reachability model checkers and you have an actually a network of hybrid automata, they don't do very well. And in that context, your work is, is even more important because of uh, uh, even though there are all those uh, exciting applications. Uh, I think that the situation for many of the tools is, is, is not very hopeful at the moment. Do, do you have any experience to report in that sense? So I can tell you, I, can, uh, I tend to, to agree with, with, uh, with your statement here because uh, the, this, these tools uh, tend to suffer, you know, as the, the complexity and the dimensionality of, of the system uh, increases. Um, I know that you know that there have been uh, recent uh, uh, advances in uh, uh, in checking reachability of linear systems with very high dimensional linear systems using uh, some some particular kind of set uh, representation for that that they manage really to scale it up to, to many dimensions. Um, I don't remember, I, I, and I'm pretty sure there should be. be this should be implemented in some uh, in some specific tools, but uh, for nonlinear systems and you know many components, which translates into uh, you know a large uh, state space, and yes, the, the the situation is is tricky. And bottom line is that okay, the approach that you that you saw today uh, at the end 
uh, unless the system is deterministic and you can simulate it forward only with one trajectory and in that case you, you might not need uh, a model checker we need still these model checkers to, to uh, label uh, to, to create the data set okay and so uh, in, in some way um, yeah, in some way we, we are a bit limited uh, uh, by, by, by the uh, you know the performance of, of these tools when we, when we create the data set. Mm -hmm. uh, but let me add uh, one more thing is that in, in the stochastic in the stochastic case we consider um, stochasticity but no non-determinism meaning that we create our data sets by using Monte Carlo or simulations. Mm -hmm. And that's a more efficient way <laughs> of, 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 you know, of doing things. Okay, I, uh, I, uh, perhaps I can entice you to think about the problem in that case. The reason why we are interested in networks of uh, a hybrid automata is because in the you define paradigm of the nodes that we have. We want to say, okay, for there are some purposes for which having process algebraic models are more interested than have autom uh, automata models, but uh, equally there are situations, model checking, where we want the automata as, uh, as well. So to establish that that uh, compatibility between the process algebraic model and the automata-based model is much easier if we can handle networks of automata where you can reflect the uh, uh, very modular and compositional algebra, uh, algebraic mm -hmm. characterizations. And so without that, the argument of unification is, is much harder. And so I, I, if we think about pre, pre, predictive monitoring, I would also ask about where do, do the properties come from? And again, I would want to see some unification in terms of uh, uh, how, where these properties, how, they, how we arrive at these properties. And perhaps we could have pre prediction based not only on one uh, 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 um, property but a collection of them mm -hmm. and i know that makes the problem much harder but perhaps more exciting as well thank you, yeah, thank you. Yeah, to be honest we have a little a little thing here that 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 we experimented with is composing monitors for boolean compositions of, of, of mm -hmm. properties and, and we have some some results there uh, there is a little compositionality uh that, that we support in, in in this work but but some i think that i'm sure there's something more more sophisticated, more advanced can, can, can be done. But, but thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Nico. Thank you. Thank you both for the very interesting discussion. Are there any further questions? We are almost out of time, but maybe we can take one quick question if there is any burning one. I have a few, but I, I will, I will catch uh, Nicola later in the corridor and then ask further yeah. questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Anyone wants to ask a burning question before we close this session? Just waiting for one second. No? Are we all fine? Good. So there will be another verifiability talk in two weeks. Thank you very much for Nicola. Uh, th thank you very much, Nicola, for, for this uh, exciting and very interesting talk. There are lots of uh, leads that we can follow regarding our research at the No.